I do some consulting work on the American feeling in the room was You don't ever say to her that what about the shock points? She was qualified for services. We left. More of a community. We're trying to back over. Are doing in autism? Michael Mann is one of the nation's leading climatologists. He was a member of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the team of scientists that chaired the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007. Mann holds joint appointments at Penn State in the Departments of Meteorology and Geosciences and the Earth and Environmental Systems Institute. His 2012 book, The Hockey Stick and the Climate Wars, Dispatches from the Front Lines, is his personal account of the 2009 hacked email controversy that came to be known as Climate Gate. We'll talk with him about his iconic hockey stick graph, what he calls an ongoing assault on climate science and climate scientists, and his outlook on the future of our planet. Here's our conversation with Michael Mann. Michael Mann, welcome to the conversation. Oh, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Before we talk about your book, I want to talk a little bit about you. You grew up in Amherst, Massachusetts. Your father was a college math professor. You were somewhat of a whiz kid. Uh, math and science came very easily, uh, uh, easy to you. Uh, you were educated at Berkeley and Yale. And after facing what you call in your book a vocational crisis, you got involved in climate science. What sparked that interest? Well, I was, um, I had... Uh been very interested in, in, in physics as an undergraduate um, and I decided to uh, go to graduate school to study theoretical physics in part because of some of the big uh, unsolved uh, problems uh, that uh, were left to be worked on in, in, in theoretical physics. And what I found, um, it, the time that I was uh, sort of in, going into that field in the late 1980s, um, it was actually a difficult time uh, for uh, physics for funding. Uh, the uh, superconducting super collider didn't get funded and so what was happening was that a lot of physicists were uh, sort of getting funneled into uh, increasingly um, uh, more uh, technical and, and detailed problems. Um, and I was interested in working on you know some big picture uh, scientific problem. I'd always uh, liked sort of the big picture side of science. And I saw, um, I literally opened up the catalog at, uh, at Yale and saw that there was a uh, professor in the Department of Geology and Geophysics who was uh, using uh, physics and math uh, to study Earth's climate. And that sounded absolutely fascinating to me. So I went and talked with him, and I guess the rest is history. In the beginning of your book, The Hockey mm. Stick and the Climate Wars, Dispatches mm. from the Front Lines, mm. that's your personal account of what you call mm. an ongoing an aggressive assault on climate science and on climate scientists. Before we talk mm. about that, why did you mm. write that book, this book? Well, I felt like uh, I needed to tell my story. Um, I had sort of gotten to the point uh, where uh, there were so many things that had happened to me, um, the attacks that I'd been subjected to, that I felt that I had an opportunity by telling my story, uh, by using uh, that as a vehicle um, to uh, explore some of the larger issues uh, about the science, about the attacks against the science, about um, the role of skepticism in science and the distinction between true skepticism and what often uh, uh, passes for skepticism but is no such thing. It's, it's contrarianism or, or denial. It's a rejection of mainstream science. This all came to a head in 2009, November of 2009, mm -hmm. when thousands of, of emails between you and fellow scientists were hacked and leaked uh, on the internet. Uh, tell us a little bit about, and, and we should say that this was done on the eve of the climate conference in Copenhagen. Uh, explain what happened and how you first learned about that. Sure, and it, you know, it's probably not a coincidence that this all did happen in the lead up to uh, the Copenhagen summit, which was the first opportunity in several years for a meaningful discourse, uh, a meaningful um, uh, a policy discussion about what to do about uh, the problem of climate change, of human-caused climate change. Um, so in the weeks leading up to that, um, there was a uh, criminal uh, a hacking, a theft of thousands of emails from a, a server, a university um, in, a web server in the UK. And uh, these emails were uh, leaked out into the public domain. And what ensued was really, um, you know, you'd have to call it a smear campaign against all of climate science and in, in, in many of the individual climate scientists such as myself where 
uh, individual words and, and phrases were taken out of context and then strung together uh, to try to make it sound like scientists were fudging the data, like, uh, uh, like as if scientists were engaged in uh, all sorts of supposed, um, you know, uh, acts hoax, of impropriety. As, as many people have uh, an it. elaborate hoax, um, and uh, you know, not only uh, a hoax uh, perpetrated by thousands of scientists around the world but apparently global sea level and ice sheet melting was playing along with the hoax as well. Well, one of the maybe unfortunate words was the word trick. That's one that, that just got circulated uh, through the internet as, as a word that just explained what you and other scientists were doing, tricking Americans. Yeah, so that, w one of the things that was so uh, pernicious about this, this campaign, uh, this smear campaign, uh, was um, uh, the cynical way that those who were looking to discredit uh, climate scientists uh, took uh, words and phrases um, that are actually a lingo that are used in a very appropriate context in science. A trick is a mathematical trick um, is a clever way of solving a vexing problem. That's the way that uh, scientists and mathematicians use the term. And in fact, uh, the uh, world's uh, arguably the world's premier science journal, uh, Nature, actually wrote an editorial pointing that out, pointing out that actually, you know, a trick is something, uh, is just a clever way of solving a problem in science. But to those who are unfamiliar with the lingo uh, of, of science and the lingo that, are, that is used by scientists and the jargon, um, it's easy to take something like that and make it sound like scientists were talking about, you know, uh, engaging in, a, in an elaborate hoax. Um, in fact, it was uh, the specific instance that was being referred to in that email was simply a plotting device to compare two different data sets. And uh, Nature, in their editorial, shortly after this all broke, said that uh, there was absolutely nothing inappropriate whatsoever in you know what that email was talking about. But it was used. Uh, it was plastered across the TV screens and on the front pages of newspapers in what uh, you know, we can really only call perhaps the most um, organized and, and uh, most carefully orchestrated smear campaign against science in modern history. In fact, in your book it says it's been called the best funded, most carefully orchestrated assault on science uh, that the world has ever known. The tactics that were used were, were not necessarily new tactics. No, I mean, uh, what, was, what was taking place here was really um, right out of uh, the, the playbook uh, of other um, past campaigns to deny uh, science, scientific findings. Smoking isn't harmful, for example. Exactly. Science, uh, when it collides with um, vested interests, um, uh, in many cases in the past, vested interests have looked to discredit the science, whether we're talking about uh, the linkage between smoking cigarettes and lung cancer or the harmfulness of uh, certain pesticides um, on down the list. Any time that the findings of science have collided with powerful vested interests, um, what's um, you know that that collision um, has resulted, unfortunately, in um, you know in cynical efforts to discredit that science. You write in the book that this disinformation campaign that you said was really mm. uh, you describe it as a war that has been waged for for twenty plus years. You say that it was abetted by an uninformed media. Yeah, I, and I think that that's, um, you know, there, there, there is a broader context, uh, you know, the discussion in the book uh, where one of the things I talk about was um, this very unfortunate trend that we've seen over the past decade or so um, where uh, many uh, media organizations have laid off their science and technology uh, teams. This happened at CNN. Uh, they laid off their entire science and technology team. The Weather Channel uh, laid off an entire unit. Um, that uh, did their uh, climate uh, science uh, component of their, um, of, of their coverage. And um, really across the boards, uh, we've seen um, a sort of large-scale uh, disappearance of uh, science and environmental uh, reporting, and it's been replaced in many cases with um, reporters from other beats that don't necessarily have the background and the training to cover these difficult issues. Scientific illiteracy is, is what you're getting at then. And, and in fact, you've called some of the reporting uh, really nothing more than, than working as a stenographer. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, if you don't 
um, you know, if a, if, if a reporter um, doesn't have um, a, a background, um, doesn't have a context for understanding the debates that take place uh, within science, then it, it's all too easy to fall back upon sort of the default um, sort of, I guess, journalism 101 approach of presenting both sides. And uh, so there's a tendency to uh, present, on the one hand, um, the mainstream scientific consensus, and on the other hand, a small number of uh, contrarians, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, um, of iconoclasts who are willing uh, to challenge what the overwhelming majority of the scientific community says. And so the public sees that and they figure it's a toss-up that we really don't know. I've read it in, in your book that 95% of the scientists who are engaged in the discipline involved in, in climate studies do agree in human-induced global warming. You look at a poll, though, like the 2011 Gallup poll, 51% of Americans uh, are concerned about global warming, but 48% aren't much concerned or not at all concerned. If you look at um, uh, most of the polling that's been done over the past few years, um, there is a very large segment of the population um, that uh, does, even if they um, you know, understand that the globe is warming, um, they're not sure that it's attributable to human activity. And in part, I blame that on the sort of he said, she said uh, coverage that this issue often has received, unfortunately, in the mainstream, uh, in, in the public discourse. Um, I just got back from a meeting of the uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science, um, and uh, in one of the plenary uh, talks, uh, the speaker um, uh, had, um, their, the audience uh, was equipped with clickers, and so you could pose a question to the audience and get an instant poll response from the audience, and he asked, you know, the audience, this was an audience, a uh, broad uh, cross-section of scientists in various fields, um, how many of them uh, accepted uh, the uh, proposition that uh, the climate is changing and humans are largely responsible for it. And it was 86 percent. So it's 86 percent um, across the board uh, in the scientific community, and there were some journalists present as well. Uh, versus this sort of 50% number. It's a huge gulf, and there, uh, that same gulf exists uh, if you look at you know, what scientists are actually debating at meetings and in the peer-reviewed uh, uh, literature. Uh, we don't debate the reality of human-caused climate change. Uh, we debate the precise impacts, how much, uh, what are uh, the feedback processes that may amplify um, uh, global warming, whereas if you read the newspapers and you follow um, you know, the coverage, uh, the mainstream coverage of this issue in the public discourse, uh, you might very uh, well get the impression that it's a toss-up, that it's a 50-50 proposition. That is, um, it's, it's troubling to many of us who, uh, who work in this area. You've described it as, as a street fight. Uh, those who are looking to discredit um, the science, to discredit the scientists, they don't play by the same rules of honest uh, discourse and, and logic and, and reasoning and good faith um, debate um, that scientists uh, obey. What's being forwarded is that you and other climate scientists have been put on the map because of this debate, uh, that you are being handsomely uh, rewarded mm. with, with grants. Uh, the U.S. government spends more than any other government on mm. this kind of science. Yeah, I, you, I often hear that uh, argument uh, by again those who are, are uh, you know distrustful of, of the of science uh, of the scientists um, and of the science of climate change, and it's it's so disconcerting to 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 so many of us um, who you know work in science who are scientists um, that um, there's such a a lack today uh, of um, a sort of a broad uh, appreciation uh, by many in the public of of what sci how science actually works and, and what dr actually drives scientists. Um, you know, we're, we're driven by curiosity uh, about the natural world. And in my book, I talk about you know, how that is how I came into science because I was curious and I wanted to solve problems. And uh, we often pass up many other far more lucrative opportunities um, and spend you know, six or seven years in graduate school uh, to um, you know, get an advanced degree that will allow us to, to go on and do what we love doing, which is science. And um, the reality is that you know, the grants that we raise um, 
uh, we don't get rich off of them. They go to uh, fund our research programs, to fund our graduate students, our postdoctoral researchers, um, to pay for publications, all the things that uh, you need to be advancing your research program. Um, and, you know, we could probably, um, if I really wanted to uh, make a whole lot of money, if I wanted to get rich, uh, probably the best thing for me to do would be to denounce my own work and, and the work of my colleagues. And I'm sure I would be, be rewarded handsomely if I chose to do that. And, and this has gotten very personal. Uh, you have been called uh, a fraud. Uh, your family has received threats. There have been campaigns to stop you from getting government funding. Uh, Penn State has been cues, uh, accused of, of whitewashing this whole thing by, uh, with other organizations vindicating uh, you, saying that there was no uh, scientific uh, wrongdoing. There have been attack ads in, in the in the Collegian. Uh, what has the toll been on you personally from this? Well, you know, I, I certainly never signed up for this when I decided to go to graduate school and, and study physics and then move into the field of climate modeling. Um, you know, and none of us sign up for that sort of treatment, but it's a fact of life. It's part of the job description. If you uh, are a prominent uh, uh, voice um, in uh, the scientific debate over climate change today, um, uh, you will be subject to these sorts of attacks. Um, so, you know, I, I describe in the book uh, uh, many of the attacks that I've been subjected to, uh, but um, in fact, I have dozens of colleagues who get death threats, um, who are have things said about them much nastier than anything <laughs> that you, uh, you know, uh, repeated um, uh, a few moments ago. And how, how did you become the center of, of this attack, though? Well, um, back in the late 1990s, um, my uh, co-authors and I uh, published uh, a reconstruction. We wanted to uh, figure out uh, how unusual uh, modern uh, climate change uh, actually is. We only have about 100 years of thermometer measurements to determine how the temperature of the globe has changed. And so one question that scientists have uh, asked for some time is, well, we know that there's been a warming over that period, but how unusual is that? Could it be natural? Does, do periods of warming like that take place in the past? And so we turned to what we call proxy uh, data, like uh, tree, tree rings, rings and corals and ice cores, to try to piece together that puzzle of how the climate changed further back in time. And ultimately, it led to a, a graph that uh, represented our estimate of, of how temperatures years. had changed for a thousand years. Um, and what we found was that uh, there were relatively warm conditions uh, you know, about a thousand years ago during the medieval era. Um, and then the climate slowly descended into this period we call the Little Ice Age, uh, a cold period from the 17th through the 19th centuries. Um, and then there was the abrupt warming of the past century, which in our estimate, uh, takes us outside of anything that we've seen over the past thousand years. Um, Although many people would argue that a thousand years is a blink of an eye in terms of the age of our planet. Uh, sure, um, and really, what's um, you know what's most unusual, or, or what's uh, you know what we gives us the most concern about modern climate change, isn't so much the magnitude of, of the changes, but the how quickly. The time scale of those changes, how quickly those changes are, are taking place. You know, we know that CO2 levels uh, were higher uh, than they are today, um, probably twice as high or more uh, than they are today. Um, back in the time when the dinosaurs were roaming in the planet in the early Cretaceous period, 100 million years ago. Um, and then CO2 levels slowly dropped and the climate got colder. Uh, but those changes took place on time scales of tens of millions of years. We are elevating CO2 concentrations to similar levels now on a time scale of tens of years, and so that's really the difference. Uh, but the, our reconstruction, I think the reason that it became such a focal point. Um, is this the, hockey stick graph. It was called the hockey stick because you have that long-term decline, mm -hmm. it's like a handle, the modern warming, uh, the blade, and so a colleague of mine named it the hockey stick. And it became an icon in the climate change debate because it told a very simple story. You didn't have to understand fancy statistics. You didn't have to know how a climate model works, how a theoretical climate model works, to understand uh, the uh, story that this reconstruction was telling, that there were unprecedented changes taking place today in our climate. Um, and as happens to icons in the climate change debate, uh, they get attacked fiercely. And thus it was that uh, my co-authors and I were subject to 
now what's well over a decade of all sorts of assaults on our, our character, our integrity, uh, attempts, as you alluded to, to um, have our funding taken away, um, to uh, you name it. It's probably happened to us at one point or another. That hockey stick graph was created 14 years ago. Does it stand up today? Yes. In, in fact, what's interesting um, is while critics like to focus on this more than decade-old st uh, original study, um, uh, there are now dozens of research groups uh, that have used uh, different data and, and different methods. And in every case, they've come to the conclusion that the recent warming is anomalous in as far back as we can go. In fact, now the reconstructions extend even further back, um, at least 1,300 or 1,500 years. And so our conclusions today are actually more confident than they were 10 years ago, but our, the critics still like to attack the hockey stick, this one 10-year-old study. It's much like, uh, uh, it's similar to the way that uh, uh, critics of uh, the theory of evolution continue to go after Charles Darwin, as if the whole theory depends on Darwin and not the thousands of scientists over the past century and a half which have reaffirmed his conclusions. It's so easy to uh, make a caricature out of science, to create a straw man by making it seem as if all of the science depends not just on one line of evidence or one study, but one person. And unfortunately, that's what's happened to us. You were a uh, part of the 2007 team of scientists who won the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, you were part of the Intergovernmental Panel on, on Climate uh, Change with Al Gore. A and I've often mm -hmm. wondered, if, because this is such a polarizing issue, if Al Gore had not been the spokesperson for uh, an inconvenient truth or for this IPCC report, do you think we'd be having the same debate? It's a great question. Uh, one, one sort of minor uh, point of clarification is uh, Gore wasn't actually associated with the, the IPCC in any way, um, but the Nobel Prize was jointly awarded to the IPCC and, and to Al Gore okay. uh, collectively. And, um, and certainly he did become, uh, in you know, 2006, 2007, um, with uh, winning the, you know, with him uh, being co-awarded the Nobel Prize, uh, Peace Prize um, with the success of his movie An Inconvenient Truth. Um, he, he certainly uh, became sort of the face of climate change to, to, to the public uh, to a large extent. And unfortunately, uh, that allowed um, uh, those who had been looking to discredit the science now to sort of portray it as a partisan political issue because now we had this partisan political figure, Al Gore, who was the face of climate change. And um, there are, there's some debate about the extent to which this is really true, but there are those who argue that that may have been sort of one of the um, critical uh, early stages in the increased polarization political polar, uh, polarization that we have seen on this issue now over the past five years or so. Um, and that's unfortunate. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat or Republican, uh, you know, you, your children and grandchildren are going to uh, be subject to the same impacts uh, of climate change. Um, it's, it's such a shame that it's become a partisan political issue because it shouldn't be. We should all care about you know, future generations and making sure that we preserve the planet for them. The Wonk Room did an exclusive survey and, and said that in the 112th Congress, every single Republican freshman in the U.S. Senate and House denies mm. human-induced global warming. Yeah, it's, you know, it, it, it's such a shame uh, that it has become so uh, politicized uh, you know, along partisan lines. Um, in, in, my, in the book, I, you know, one of the things I talk about is that some of the, the real heroes in our story were prominent Republicans. When Sherwood Bullard, for example. Sherwood Bullard uh, was a sort of old school, um, northeastern, uh, pro-science, pro-environmental, uh, moderate Republican. Uh, he was the chair of the House Science Committee. And when uh, Joe Barton of Texas uh, went after my co-authors and me, um, uh, attempting to subject us to what uh, some characterized as a witch hunt or an inc inquisition um, because of the inconvenient nature of our scientific findings. Um, uh, there were several uh, politicians who came to our defense and some of them uh, were Democrats, but some of them were prominent Republicans like Sherwood Bollert or John McCain. 
You write in your book about fighting back and about the tide turning. And so I wonder how optimistic are you going forward that people will pay attention to what you and other scientists are saying? Well, I hope that that's the case. And I like to think one silver lining um, in having sort of become an, an almost accidental and reluctant uh, public figure in this larger debate about climate change is that it has given me an opportunity to, to try to educate the public about uh, the reality of the problem and um, and what we you know the options to deal with it and uh, one uh, point that I often like to emphasize is that we can have a good faith debate there's a worthy debate to to be had about what policies to enact to deal with the problem but there is no longer a good faith debate to be had over the reality of the problem. It's a fake debate, you have said. It, it is, and we've moved past it. Um, um, and it's so unfortunate that we're still stuck in that fake debate about the reality of the problem when we could be making progress figuring out how to deal with it and, you know, considering uh, all options um, and allowing all those who have an interest in this matter uh, to have a voice in the discussion. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to have that good faith debate because we're still stuck in the bad faith debate about the reality of the science. Michael Mann, thank you so much for talking with us. Uh, thank you. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Michael Mann. Comcast subscribers can watch this program anytime on Penn State On Demand. Find out how through our website, conversations.psu.edu, where you'll also find more information on Mann's research and latest book, The Hockey Stick and the Climate Wars. I'm Patty Satalia. We hope you'll join us for our next conversation from Penn State. If you would like to purchase a DVD of this or any episode of Conversations from Penn State, order online at mediasales.psu.edu or call 1-800-770-2111. Production funding provided in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Thank you. This has been a production of WPSU.